Roger Green, host of the Surfing the National Tsunami podcast. This week, we are offering a range of conversations from our coverage during the International Liver Congress 2022 and from this week's Surfing Nash wrap-up episode. This conversation comes from the back half of episode 33, where Louise Campbell, PBC Foundation CEO and fatty liver patient Robert Mitchell Thane, starts with Robert focusing on his own experience as patient in terms of the internal processing through which he came to believe that a 10 to 15% weight loss was an attainable goal after exhibiting an emotional flight or fight reaction when first hearing about his diagnosis. He comments fight or flight is an emotional response, not related to problem solving, which makes it suboptimal for patients considering ways to make life changes. It makes more sense to absorb the data and then come back into a subsequent conversation, maybe with a doctor, maybe a nurse, maybe other helpers to figure out how to make changes. There's more in this conversation, but this topic takes up most of it, and the rest of it is equally stimulating. ILC 2022 covered a vast array of issues around drug development, non-invasive testing, patient screening and treatment, and the entire process of provider-patient communications. On each topic, there were conversations that can enlighten every fatty liver stakeholder and promise a more optimistic future for us all. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. Robert Mitchell Fain. I'm going to take a slight step to the left because this is a personal button of mine. Now, so I've been involved as a patient advocate for 20 years and I've been diagnosed with fatty liver disease for five. So I'm coming from two entirely different perspectives. But I would ask each and every single person who is affected by a condition to not only describe themselves as a patient, but to absolutely own it. So when you come to conferences like these, you have clinicians who are clinical experts, but you also have patients who are patient experts. And so when you see a clinician, it's a 15 minute appointment, and maybe that's once a year, once every six months, and that's a tiny, tiny snapshot of your life. But when it comes to living your life, when it comes to dealing with the condition, physically, emotionally, psychologically, you are absolutely the expert. So please, anyone who watches, anyone who's listening, please take ownership of the word patient and become the patient expert become part of the solution because when you look around at these kind of conferences the clinical world need us to engage to help find the solutions and the the sooner we do that the sooner we take ownership and the sooner we realize the power we have with that expertise i think we're going to help the whole process louise campbell it would be interesting post-conference i'd like to see the british liver trust's data echo census data and escopics data because they've all been scanning people and i have certainly seen a lot of soft fatty livers in our our own community of physicians and nurses and I think that surprised some people but it'll be interesting to get the figures because I know when the British Liver Trust went into the Houses of Parliament at Westminster about 30% of all MPs they scanned needed a referral to their GP now that might be for stiffness that might be for cap I don't, I, they weren't using it before but I do believe they're using it now so it will be very interesting if we can get that data there's also sometimes difficulty when patients say you're telling me to do this but you don't follow it yourself we're all human none of us are perfect and we may eat more drink more at various different times it's a very hard conversation to have people say to me because i'm relatively slim you can't talk about obesity or diet no i can't talk about how it feels to have that but i can talk and listen And I can empathize with you and I can give you suggestions on what you tell me that might help. We shouldn't presume to be able to just prescribe and expect them to do it and say they're not following my rules and regulations. They're just difficult to engage. But you stay with somebody. They will engage. It's when you disengage as healthcare that we tend to run into a problem. So when we lose, uh, Stephen Harrison did a very good presentation this afternoon on the resume to one data from Maestro um, 1. There was a a non-serotic population and it was F2. In fact, the fibre scan had to be above 5.5 and less than 7.5 and a cap had to be over 280. So it's just soft fatty livers. But because it was during COVID, they did lose a number of patients to follow up and people who didn't want to come back yeah. quite rightly i think yeah. a lot of patients didn't take at least two months worth of medication i think there was a hiatus in it but it still showed benefits it still met its endpoint. it still showed that the side effects were 
tolerable. That sort of data is really important because that's the sort of data we talk to people about trials. It might not be the trial you go on, but actually we've got to engage people. No, it's a fair point. And so I jumped back to my day of diagnosis when we were having this conversation. And I remember, so you'll remember the data that actually comes back, but I remember being told at the time that a 10 to 15% reduction in my weight has an enormous implication in terms of reducing my risk. And you might remember the percentage off the top of your head. I certainly don't, but it is monumental compared to that 10 to 15% of weight. Yep. And so even at that moment in time, I thought 10%. I can do that. And just having that focus was enormously helpful. And going back to the clinical appointments and everything else that goes on. So there have been a huge amount of data and studies that tell us that from the moment you're spoken to or with in the clinical appointment to when you close the door when you leave, you lose somewhere between 40 and 70% of the information that was transferred. Yeah. Just straight in, straight out. And the other part, so coming from my professional side now, when I look at emotional, psychological and physical self-management, is that when you perceive a threat, you start to operate in the emotional part of your brain. So you're not thinking solutions, you're not thinking win-win, you're thinking I've heard a threat and so I'm going to jump to survival mode. So you're talking fight, flight, you're talking about adrenalizing the body, all of these things, none of which help you in the process. And even the simple conversation of somebody saying, you know what, actually you could do the losing a few pounds is enough to trigger the emotional part of the brain, which then creates this defense mechanism mm. response. And so we as human beings, instead of hearing that, and, you know, frankly, you know, someone could say to me today, I can do with losing a few pounds. And it's absolutely 100% true. But when you hear it in a, such a way that you then react emotionally, when you, the defense mechanism comes with it, you're then again becoming your own barrier to the solution. Mm. And again, I think it's important to acknowledge that because if that happens to you, that's okay. Because that's a perfectly natural response. But once you're aware of that, you've then got the chance to come back a couple of days later and think about it in a much more level-headed, cognizant way to say, you know what, I can do that 10%. Now, it's taken me years to gain that 10%, so it's going to take me time to lose it. But actually, 10%, I can do. And I think what we know, and there's been, again, abstracts here and abstracts earlier on the year, we've discussed it on the podcast, the quality of the diet helps. And so, for some people, they won't need to lose 10%. But if we're not measuring that, it's just a carte blanche. Yeah. There was a very good session today on type 2 diabetes and its relation to cancers and that in a session. And I have to say, it was delayed because she had no reception in Finland. She drove her car to the top of a hill to get reception and most people stuck out the lecture with the intermittent. Yeah. So Helena and I can't say her name but she she deserves the award for gone the furthest mile to get her session done and Helen Reeves stepped in with the cancer risks okay. and fatty in any of the studies and the meta-analysis increases the risk of primary HCC. We know that but again it's nice to see the data. There was some there was a Swedish study that didn't suggest Yes, that you screen. The trouble is the, the WHO is not meeting its SDGs on cancer. So maybe we have to revisit that somewhere so along the line. When you say SDG? A sustainable development goals. And the one they're definitely not going to hit is locating and the rise of cancer. And it's predominantly because the rise of liver cancer is so exponential that nobody can keep a track on it. NHS England have tasked most areas of the UK to do a thousand fibre scans to locate higher risk patients. Whether they get that done, yeah. because we know that we don't have uniform access to fibre scan. I think 74% of the country don't have it. So we talk a good game, but as Jeff Lezer has said, the UK is top of the list of somebody who can get a NAFL programme in, but we all failed. We just failed less than somebody else. No, that's fair point. What I commented on yesterday's podcast was what I now want to see is not next year redoing the same data in a different way. I would like to see something happen with that data. We know that primary care, where it works um, in by scanning, or testing people in their community areas filters out the right patients to go to hepatology. And we've known that for a long time, but we don't put it into any pathways yet. It's just funded by those local areas like Nottingham, Hampshire, Southampton are the three that I can think of off the top of my head. And that must be really frustrating from a patient network perspective. We talk about equity, equality, diversity, and it doesn't hit any of those. So funnily enough, so thinking about your Finnish presenter who went that extra mile, and when you think about the number of clinicians that we know personally, that we've met, and, and some that we've heard in these podcasts, these are clinicians that will go the extra mile, mm -hmm. and yet they're hitting systemic blockages. Yeah. 
And I think it's important, again, for, for patients to know that sometimes the frustration that we feel is being felt by our clinicians and they're trying to do their utmost to help us. And sometimes it isn't the clinician who's the, the barrier, the obstacle. And I think it's, a, it's an important realisation. Her name was Henele Yiki Jarvinen. And I apologise now for my Finnish pronunciation, but she was doing NASH and type 2 diabetes. And she came up with lots of um, medications where they work and where they don't work, where okay. they help weight loss, where they don't help weight loss. Yeah. And the over 10% was able to reverse NASH. So there's a lot of that evidence. But there's also been lots of evidence about the quality of diet can actually change your liver fat quite substantially. In a year's time, coming back, what would you like to see different? What do you think will be on the agenda? If you had a crystal ball, and what would you like to see on the patient agenda from clinical trials or from so I would, lifestyle? I would love to see patient reported experience or outcome measures. So patients talking about, actually, I transformed my life. Patients talking about the impact that support groups have had to help them manage that change. And you know, managing change is a, a multi-million dollar pound yen industry. And nobody's found the one answer. But I think if the patients can come together and say, this is what we found is helpful, and be part of that conversation, be invited by bodies like ESO, by the clinicians, that I think we'll get that ball rolling just a little bit faster. And that's, that's the biggest single thing I would like to see next year. In terms of what we will see, I honestly don't know. I'd be curious to, to see what happens. I think ASLD will be a good guidance in terms of what the trial results are. I think this movement forward is absolutely vital. And I think yeah. the dialogue that's happening is now happening across the board. It is. And I certainly think people are more receptive to looking at the other facets yeah. of a clinical trial rather than just drug development. And I think there are obviously some big companies that sort of straddle obesity in children as well as diabetes, as well as fatty liver, no no risk for one. What I do think next year, it'll be interesting because I was in San Francisco when Ed Gain delivered the results for Sophosphavir okay. for the first time. Yeah, wow. And every room, an outside room, absolutely rammed yeah. for that data. Will we get that next year from the resmeterone studies or something like that? I don't know. I'd like to think so. I, but if not, at easel, ours will maybe next year. I, I would think so. So I remember the olden days coming from the PBC world mm. where the hep C lectures would be mobbed and it's like, now we're going to talk about PBC and, you know, but empty. And then we talk about NASH and you get one or two interested people. And, and that's absolutely changed. And I think there are more great minds. I think there are more meaningful networks. And I think there are more companies than ever who are looking at this in a serious, joined-up way. Mm. And I think, hope that this one is the one that makes a difference. Can I ask you, PBC is often ruled out in any Naffold and NASH study. So what is there any research going on in PBC patients with Naffold that's and a, NASH? That's a great question. Because when I fibre scan people, yeah. I then have yeah. to have that dialogue about diet because it's two conditions. And I think it's something we need to be aware. But is 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 there, I, I presume, like hepatitis C and HIV, it progresses quicker, hepatitis C and hepatitis B. The more you have, the quicker the progression. But I haven't seen much evidence on it. No, that's a great question. So I'm not aware aware of any holistic study in terms of looking at the two conditions together. And you made me smile because so at the BBC Foundation, they've worked really hard with the Global Living Institute, <laughs> particularly on IND, to raise patients' awareness that just because you have PBC, and it's not just a PBC thing, PSC, AIH, you can have a whole number of other liver conditions and that will never stop you developing fatty liver or NASH because they're two entirely different mechanisms and, you know, for all the reasons we know it can affect the general population, it can also affect the liver population mm. in the same way. And so we've worked really hard to raise patients' awareness that, okay, yes, I may have PVC, but I also need to look at this aspect of my life as well. Mm. And when you look at features such as the fatigue in PVC, the number one way to overcome that fatigue is meaningful activity. And I'm really careful not to say exercise, because yeah. when you say meaningful activity, singing, yeah. pushing the kids in a swing, you know, all of these kind of things can, you know, and you don't need to, we're likely to do any of those things. <laughs> So, by benefit. <laughs> but those are really, really important. And so there is much more awareness within the patient community. But no, and, and you raise a fantastic point. I think it would be really good to see 
some of these comorbidity types. Even just a small yeah. studies, because yeah. otherwise our patients with other liver diseases who have fatty liver as well will be exempt from any of these medications and they'll be treated off-label. And we don't know what the effect is. No. I haven't seen a lot of data on it or whether or not we're looking at it. That may just be because I haven't searched the um, database for the trials at the moment. But so, no, to my shame, I'm not aware of anything either. So, so. Maybe it's an unmet need, rare liver disease that also has fatty liver because we spend a lot of time talking about maximising the one disease that's genetic and will progress for most people. Yeah. Let's keep it as healthy as possible. Absolutely. Because there's a lot of focus at the moment on NAFLD. It's moved from hepatitis C to NAFLD. Yeah. And, and I'm very aware that rare liver diseases are always at the bottom of the pile because there's not a lot we can do currently. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the contents of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week with our final ILC 22 wrap-up, Scott Friedman and Neil Henderson discussing some of the basic science issues from the meeting. Please join us for all that. Until then, stay safe and surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.